All right, well, <clears throat> as I uh, threatened this morning, not really threatened, but said, that uh, I would read a little bit more about the account of the birth of Christ. I, I want to do that this evening, even though our text isn't really contained in this passage. It, it is because this is part of the Lord's uh, fulfillment of his promise to send Jesus into the world to be our Savior. But I'd like to read Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 20, and then take up what we began to look at this morning uh, with regard to the mission that the Father sent Jesus into the world to perform. You shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. Now in those days a, decrees went out, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. This was the first census taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone was on his way to register for the census, each to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family of David, in order to register along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was with child. While they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. In the same region, there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terribly frightened. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. For today in the city of David there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in claws and lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. When the angels had gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds began saying to one another, Let us go straight to Bethlehem then, and see this thing that has happened which the Lord has made known to us. So they came in a hurry and found their way to Mary and Joseph and the baby as he lay in the manger. When they had seen this, they made known the statement which had been told them about this child, and all who heard it wondered at the things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary treasured all these things, pondering them in her heart. The shepherds went back, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen, just as had been told them. Well, again, may the Lord bless his word to our uh, building up our, uh, into the image of our Lord Jesus this evening. May he encourage us in his grace and his mercies. Now, this morning we were looking at the gift God gave us so many years ago in the person of His Son. We were reminded that God didn't have to save us. He could have allowed us to perish without any violation at all to His justice. But having determined that He would save us, again, purely out of His love, there was only one way that He could, and that was through His Son, Jesus. The price of our redemption was so great that only God could pay it, but because we owed it, it had to be paid by one of us. And so the eternal Son of God became man to satisfy God's justice and to free us from judgment. The angel said uh, to Joseph, you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And again, Jesus means that he is the Lord, our salvation. Now this evening, as I've said, we're going to look more specifically at how Jesus saved us. Now this is a very broad subject, so we're going to look at each of the things Jesus did only briefly, perhaps spending a little bit more time on the first point, that Jesus saved us through his life, again because of the question that was raised regarding that I think it's important that we understand that it's not just the death of Jesus, but it's everything that he has done. Now, why we need to ask the question, why did Jesus come into the world in the way that he did? 
to be born of a virgin, to go through childhood, the teen years, and adulthood. Why couldn't he have just ascended from heaven, gone straight to the cross, made the payment, and then ascended back into heaven? Now, there might be a couple of answers to that question. I suppose we could argue that since conception and birth is the way that, that all men come into the world, with the exception, of course, of Adam and Eve, but since then, that's the way all men come. So he must come if he was to be fully human. And, of course, that is the way he came. Paul writes, when the fullness of the time came. God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. Now, unlike us, he was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and we know that it was important that he be, so that Adam's guilt would not be imputed to him, would not be credited to him, would not be transferred to him. Not only would this ensure that our Lord Jesus Christ would be free from guilt, if he were guilty, he couldn't pay for his own crimes, let alone ours, but also from the corruption, from the hatred that that guilt brings. Now, we could argue that, um, again, he had to be conceived by the Holy Spirit in the womb of the Virgin to come into the world the way that he does in order that he might be one of us, but that he might be a perfect one of us. But second, I think it's important that he had to start where we start and go through what we go through to do what we should have done, but we didn't do, and that is obey God. To be our Redeemer, Jesus had to become our surety. Our surety means one who guarantees something. Jesus comes into the world in order to guarantee that the blessings of the covenant, God's covenant with mankind, might be met so that we would inherit the blessing of eternal life. Well, that condition is, as it was in the covenant of works, so in the covenant of grace, the condition is perfect righteousness. The Bible says only the righteous can dwell with God. David writes in Psalm 11 verse 7, for the Lord is righteous. He loves righteousness. The upright will behold his face. David writes in Psalm 5 verse 4, you are not a God who takes pleasure in wickedness. No evil dwells with you. And along with that, no evil person obviously can. And then in Psalm 140, verse 13, Surely the righteous will give thanks to your name. The upright will dwell in your presence. Now, I think the key here is to understand what it means to be righteous, right? What does it mean to be upright? Well, that concept, that idea means to conform to the standard, to God's standard, to the law. In two ways, in our conduct, and in our character. And to put this in other terms, it means to obey God perfectly with a perfect heart. Remember, the Pharisees were those who wanted to give to God perfect conduct, but not with a perfect heart. And as we're reminded by the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 13, anything we do for God means nothing to him. As a matter of fact, it's an offense to him if it doesn't have love, if it doesn't have the perfect heart. Now, when a lawyer asked Jesus in Luke 10, verses 25 through 28, this very important question, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? What are the conditions, Jesus, of entrance into heaven? Uh, Jesus asked, first of all, what, what do you think? What does the law teach? And the lawyer answered this, and of course, he was a, an expert in the law because it was his job to transcribe the, the Old Testament scriptures. That was his job. He was a copyist, a scribe. He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. I want you to notice that... Um, when the lawyer asked the question and he answered this question, Jesus affirms that he had the right answer. Perfect obedience to God's law is the condition of eternal life. And again, perfect obedience with a perfect heart. Righteousness is more than simply avoiding what's wrong. 
It's doing what's right with the right motives. It's loving God and our neighbor as he commands us. Now, we know the lawyer could not do this any more than we can do this, which means if we are to inherit eternal life, someone else has to do this for us. Well, that's exactly what Jesus did. Jesus was born of a woman. He became one with us. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit so that he would be without sin. He was born under the law with the obligation to keep it. He was one with us, being a creature. He was under the obligation to obey his Father. So he was born under the law that he might provide a complete and perfect submission to his Father with his whole heart, mind, soul, and strength and by the way, love his neighbor as himself as well, that he might earn heaven, eternal life, not only for himself. Remember, when he became a creature, he took upon himself the obligation to obey perfectly so that he could be justified, so that he could have eternal life. But he also did that for us. Jesus lived for us in order that he might redeem us, in order that he might save us. You shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now, I shouldn't forget, as I was trying to think of how am I going to order these things, I wanted to put this one second because he did this before he, before he does the next major thing, which is die. But Jesus also saved us through his earthly ministry of teaching. Remember, he was a prophet. And what he had to say was very, very important, even as what he said to the lawyer was important. He came to teach us how we might receive what it is that he was doing. Uh, through his work. Now, he began by correcting the bad teaching of the Pharisees. Remember in the Sermon on the Mount, he said that what they are telling you to do is not enough. It's not enough merely to keep the letter of God's law. Remember, that's how the Pharisees understood it. They thought if they kept the commandments outwardly, God would accept them into heaven. But Jesus said, you're like whitewashed sepulchers. You are beautiful on the outside. You look like you're doing the right thing. But inside, your heart is full of enmity and hatred and bitterness and envy and all these things that God hates. They needed a pure heart as well as pure conduct. But Jesus goes on to say that even the way they interpreted the law wasn't enough. It wasn't good enough. Jesus said, our righteousness has to be greater than that of the Pharisees. It had to be greater than just the letter of the law. And he went on to show us exactly what he meant. When he said, you have heard that it was said, he was referring to what they taught. But when he said, but I say to you, then he was telling us what God actually meant by the law. He said, yes, it's wrong to commit adultery, but if we look at someone to lust after them. We have broken that law. It's wrong to commit murder, but we can still murder our brother or sister in our hearts and with our words. It's a sin to promise God we will do something, but then excuse ourselves for not doing it for whatever reason. Now, Jesus not only lifted the standard back up to where it should have been, he also pointed us to the only way that that standard would ever be met, and that is by believing in him. And I think here's where we often make a mistake. When Jesus says our righteousness needs to exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees, I think we often think he's talking about Jesus imputed righteousness. That's the only way we're ever going to have a greater righteousness than the Pharisees. But no, he meant personally that we need to do more than what they do. So when we trust in Jesus, we need to realize we not only receive his righteousness. Remember, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And that righteousness which Jesus earns for us and that he gives to us by faith, that is the righteousness that justifies us. But we also receive his Holy Spirit who gives us the power to keep God's law beyond what the Pharisees could do. And, you know, that's really what Paul is referring to in Romans 8, verses 3 through 4, where he says this. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, that is, through our ability to keep it, God did, 
sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, notice, so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Holy Spirit. I mean, what he means by this is simply this. He's given us the Holy Spirit to give us the power to obey his commandments, not just outwardly, but also inwardly. If we simply walk according to the Spirit, according to the power that He has given to us, rather than according to our sinful desires. That is how our righteousness is greater than that of the scribes and Pharisees. And that shows us that we are the heirs of heaven. Unless your righteousness exceeds theirs, you will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. But Jesus says, I've given you my Holy Spirit so that your righteousness will exceed theirs and that will show you that you are an heir of heaven. So Jesus saves us by his life. He saves us by his teaching, uh, by showing us the right way. Now, thirdly, Jesus saved us through his death. Now, if the first Adam, the first representative that God gave to us, if he had just obeyed God in the garden, okay, then everything would have been wonderful. We would have been born into a perfect world. We would have been perfect. We would have loved God with a perfect heart. We would have lived our lives in perfect obedience to God. And then we would have entered into the eternal state when our work of filling and subduing the earth was complete. I think that we might say we would have been justified by Adam's works. And if we are not justified by his works, all of us would have been justified by our own works because we would have given to God a perfect obedience from a perfect heart if Adam hadn't sinned. But when he did sin, when Satan tempted Eve and she fell, when she tempted Adam and he fell, we all became sinners and fell under the sentence of death. So if the second Adam was to save us, he not only needed to obey the law perfectly as we've seen, he also had to provide the atonement that we were looking at, a payment for our sins. Now this morning we saw that only Jesus could do this. Only Jesus was worthy enough, valuable enough to pay that price. Well, this of course is another reason that he came into the world. Isaiah says of him in Isaiah 53, verses 5 through 6, again, very familiar passage. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him. And by his scourging, we are healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. As Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 5.21, he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Now, Jesus had to live and he had to die in order to give us his Holy Spirit so that we might live for him. That's those two components that, again, Peter connects the giving of the Holy Spirit to the giving of, of, well, to his death on the cross where he writes this in 1 Peter 2.24, he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness for by his wounds you were healed. Now again, making the same connection that was made in Isaiah. Now, one thing we need to recognize is that the Bible most often points to Jesus' death on the cross as the one thing that he had to do in order to save us, in order to make us righteous. But we need to understand, in light of what we just saw regarding the obedience of Christ, remember, uh, keep the commandments and you will enter into eternal life, that his death on the cross is simply used as a summary of his entire work. Okay, we call that a synecdoche, which means a part for the whole. Usually his whole work is wrapped up in the atonement that he made to represent everything that Jesus did to save us. By the way, it's not just his life and his death and his teaching, but there are several other things that he did for us as well 
And that's what we want to consider. But again, it's all wrapped up most often in that one act that he does on the cross. We know it's much more than that, but that's the way it's represented. Now, fourth, Jesus saved us through his resurrection. You know, it was because he bore our sins that he suffered. Our sins put him in the grave. He suffered and died that he might pay for them. And having paid the price, he was freed from the power of death when he, well, basically, and he rose from the dead. Bas the, the fact that he paid for those sins is what released him from death. Paul tells us in Romans 1 verse 4 that Jesus was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead according to the spirit of holiness. We might say the resurrection again was Jesus' justification, the Father's declaration that he had accepted his Son. Not only that Jesus is the Son of God and that everything he said about himself was true, but that he accepted the payment that his Son had made on our behalf. Paul reminds us in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 17 through 19, that if Jesus had not been raised from the dead, that would have meant his payment was not accepted. That would mean that everyone who has trusted in him and who has died has perished. And that meant that everybody who was living at his time who trusted in Jesus would also perish and that we were all of all men most to be pitied because we were trusting in one who himself couldn't save himself but was still in the grave. But the good news is Jesus is not in the grave. Jesus was raised from the dead and because he was raised, our sins are forgiven and because our sins are forgiven, we too will be raised. So we are saved by the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Fifth, we are also saved by his ascension and his session, which is his, his being seated at the right hand of God. The author to the Hebrews writes in Hebrews 10, verses 12 through 13, But he, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God, and of course to do that he had to ascend, sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time onward until his enemies be made a footstool for his feet. You know, I've, I've said this on numerous occasions, <clears throat> we need to remember, everything Jesus did, not just his death on the cross, but in his life, and in his resurrection, and in his ascension, in his being seated in heaven, uh, all of these things that he did, he has done for us. And because he has gone through these things, we will also go through them as well. We will basically enjoy these same blessings. Paul writes with regard to his being seated in heaven in Ephesians 2, verses 4 through 7, But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive, this is spiritual resurrection, Together with Christ, by grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. You know, the interesting thing about this passage is it's talking about what is true of us spiritually. When God united us to Christ, then everything he had done became true of us, okay? We were raised from the dead. Our transgressions were forgiven. We were raised up into the heavens with Christ. We were seated with him in the heavenly places because Christ is there and we're united to him. We, in principle, are there. And that means that we will be with him after we die. We will be with him forever in order that God may show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus for the ages to come. So his ascension and his session, his seating in heaven, is also a part of, of our uh, redemption. And by the way, his session to the right hand of God means that he sits at God's right hand, clothed with all power and authority in heaven and earth, with the promise that all of his enemies will be subdued under his feet, will be conquered, and that means that he can ensure that nothing will stop him from fulfilling his promise to us.
But there's more. He also saves us through his intercession. The author to the Hebrews writes in Hebrews 7, verse 25, Therefore, he is able to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. You know, Jesus is not like the Aaronic priests who live and die, but he is of the order of Melchizedek, and he is such by power of an indestructible life, and he ever lives to make intercession for for us. So Jesus is our great high priest who, being seated in heaven as king over the universe, continues to pray for us as our priest to keep us in his grace so that nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. And then finally, he will save us, he will save us through his coming again. Now again, the author to the Hebrews writes this in Hebrews 9 verses 27 through 28. And inasmuch as it is appointed for men to die once, and after this comes judgment, so Christ also, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin to those who eagerly await him. Well, when, when we die, the Bible says that our Lord is going to come for us at death and take us to heaven. But he's also going to come a second time to bring an end to human history. And when that happens, he will raise our bodies, he will redeem them, he will save them. You know, our bodies, like our souls, are already saved in principle. Our bodies are united to Christ as our souls are united to Christ. Our whole person is united to him. When he comes again, he will redeem those bodies uh, from the grave. He will reunite them to our souls as he brings us from heaven. He will gather us along with all mankind together for the final judgment. He will acquit us on the day of his judgment, again because of what he has done, his righteousness, his death. And then he will bring us into the new heavens and the new earth where we will enjoy the presence of the Lord forever and ever. And again, we don't know everything that he has in store for us, but we do know that it will be wonderful. And it will be beyond anything we can think or imagine. So again, as we were reminded this morning, Jesus is the greatest gift God has ever given. It's the greatest gift he could conceivably give. And it is the gift that will keep on giving forever. The angel said to Joseph, you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. This is what he has done. Okay, this is what he is doing. And this is what he will do for you and for me if we are trusting in him. And so, again, this calls us to worship him, to adore him, to serve him because he deserves it, because he is worthy. So may the Lord help us to do that. Let, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we?